there are going to be people watching this around the building on screen. Um, so if we're not standing in front of these microphones, it won't make much sense at all. But it, thanks, thanks, everybody, for coming in. Uh, as you know, this is an opportunity for Fiona Duggan to present at this stage of uh, her and her team's consultation across the AA um, the various pieces of information and ideas that are beginning to emerge about some of the short and longer term thinking regarding the school buildings here. Um, for those of you that aren't aware uh, and that haven't been a part of the conversation and discussion yet, Fiona and team were brought on board by the AA early last summer to begin a consultation process that would shape for the AA a design brief for the coming few years. Um, a key part of that project is to really put together for the first time in decades, if not a full century, a definitive body of information that describes how we are organized in terms of plans, drawings, and models, how we use our spaces, and what the different ambitions and ideas are for how the school will operate, not just now, but in the, in the near future. So um, we thought at a very good moment, uh, those of us within the building committee, for Fiona to come in and present it back to everyone in the school community, and that's what today's session is about. Fiona is going to take about 30 minutes or so to provide a summary of that and then open the floor up to some conversation and discussion. So thanks, everybody, for coming in for this. Fiona Duggan. Thank you, thank you. Okay, what we, what we have here is um, the beginnings of the AA Space Brief. Um, I'm representing a multidisciplinary uh, team of four practices, uh, myself on briefing, Grace Kenny, Space Planning Consultant, Eleni Macri, Conservation Planning and Design, and John Desmond, BWA Building e Economics. What we've been doing, I, I think absorbing, consulting, reading, and liaising, um, in terms of consulting, we've talked to 60 plus of you, either via one-to-one -one interviews or small group and discussions. And I hope that you will recognize those conversations as we, we go through this um, presentation. Um, an important part, I think, of what we've been doing is actually the liaising. Uh, we started with, um, I, I think, uh, very little data. We've now got a fantastic set of CAD drawings, thanks to Scrap and his team a great model that can become the basis for um, de developing ideas, testing them through, and a space database and a room numbering system. So I think that in itself is to begin to get some base data that we can work with ha has been great. Uh, in terms of today, what I want to do is give a quick overview of the AA and the AA Bedford Square. Look at the AA today under three key headings, space, conservation, and building economics. Then have a look at what the AA tomorrow might be. Um, what a proposed development model might be for um, uh, de development. But I think in talking to people, actually how we experienced the AA w was like this. And what people talked about was entering the AA at different stages and having quite a different picture of what that is at e e each stage. And if I, I'm not going to go through um, all of them, but uh, w one thing that did strike us was the difference that we heard between the intermediate experience and the um, uh, diploma experience, both from uh, students as, as well as, as staff. Um, I think what we, where we began to get less clarity was the experience in terms of practice. And we distinguish between two types. Um, what what do, is it that AA members might want in the early stages of their practice? And we reckon it might be partnerships, exposures, getting started, getting clients, etc. In later years, maybe it was recognition and the ability to be able to give back. And then um, in terms of legacy, our, our, it's blue, it's our, our, our blue plaque. <laughs> um, and underpinning all of that was the, the public program, the visiting school and, and the CPD um, program. And this to us seemed to be a CPD, a fledgling CPD program, it has to be, to be said. But this to us felt a more accurate description in terms of experience than um, the, the, the three associations, school and, and foundation. Um, in terms of finances, what we have is um, a, a big business, 10.88 million budget for 2009-10, of which 87% of the income comes from the school. 64 of that goes on activities, 21 on facilities, and then we have our statutory and our, our contingencies. So your facilities is a big uh, a expenditure and, and, and worth spending some time on. Estate, three estates. Um, I think the urban, the rural, and the global, the thing they all have in common, we would say, is that expansion is underway. And 
in terms of expansion, we're not just talking uh, growth. I, I get a sense it's more expansion in terms of outreach, network, quality, um, uh, uh, etc. We're not talking simply size here. AA Bedford Square. Next few slides are just going to give us a, an overview um, of different data sets brought together. Uh, the first is this is the estate as it is today. It's got 5,250 square meters of net space um, with three leases that were hovering, um, 32, 33, and um, 38. If you look at hopefully the um, AA in 2010, we would have 6,800 square meters net. Um, Lease map, actually in a really good position here. The, the dark blue is leases up to uh, 21, 20, 22. So the future is secure for a long ti time here. Um, up to 2035, we think maybe on 32, 33, I think still to be confirmed, uh, with the lease on number four up to 2020, all of which have 10 yearly rent reviews. So it's a nice place of actually having security, but also having um, some, fr some freedom to um, contract out of some of these if you want. Uh, in terms of statutory designation, uh, we're in a very special place. You can see what's grade one listed, what's grade two listed, and then all of these links in the back buildings there, which are um, extensions to listed buildings, which become significant um, be because of, by virtue of that, and the couple that are unlisted. Space map, Th this we, we found I interesting. If you very simply begin to say there are you know, two, well, three distinct characters of space, there's the space at the back, which tends to, it's partly um, purpose-built office block, it's, uh, it's more generic, it, it, it's a, bi a bigger scale. And then you have the space at the front, which is um, listed, beautiful, domestic, etc. And this kind of rather hodgepodge of stuff in, in the middle. And what interested us was that the space either side is about 50-50%. Um, you'll talk more about this uh, as, as we, we go through the kinds of facilities that might work in, in either space. Looking at the AA today, um, I, I think what you've managed to achieve has been absolutely um, a, a extraordinary. The, the school has grown and grown and grown in very limited space. And I think one of the hard things is when, when a, a, an organization goes through a spurt of, of growth um, is the actual growing itself is, is very hard. Having the extra student numbers brings you the additional revenue, and it's now a great time to, to be able to capitalize on that and do something about it. But I, I don't think anyone underestimates what it is that you've been put through <laughs> in re recent years um, in terms of a space, space squad. If you look at your current space allocation, there's nothing in this that really supplies us. We looked at a, a number of types. We would say in terms of the first floor, four, the um, learning groups, um, that, that may be uh, typical with other organizations would be about 50%. It's slightly high at, at 58. Part of that, I think, is that the new space that has come on board has been given over to studio space, rightly so. That was the space that was um, very short. The other thing that did surprise us was just the core miscellaneous is actually very low. Um, we'd expect that to be at least 10%, if not 15 And for, for ex a typical purpose-built office block, it would be about 17%. Um, looking at its distribution, I think what you get is a lovely kind of pa pa patina here of, of um, different activities, and also a feeling that they, they've simply, as space has come available, as need has been I, I identified, you, you've just kind of taken space wherever it, it, it can be got. We went on to observe all of the teaching and learning spaces and the offices, academic offices, so these were the spaces that we observed. 79 spaces, looked at them from 10 to 6 o'clock, somebody observing them once an hour. Um, uh, talking about what was there, or observing, noting what was there, and it was during, I think, the third week of thir term. I think what you get is a lovely kind of pa pa patina here of, of um, different activities, and also a feeling that they, they've simply, as space has come available, as need has been I I identified, you, you've just kind of taken space wherever it, it, it can be got. We went on to observe all of the teaching and learning spaces and the offices, academic offices, so these were the spaces that we observed. 79 spaces, looked at them from 10 to 6 o'clock, somebody observing them once an hour, um, uh, talking about what was there, or observing, noting what was there, and it was during, I think, the third week of thir term, 12th to the 16th of October. Um, incredibly high on-site presence, 500 to 600 people at, at, six ti uh, at peak times, and out of that, 75% of the time being spent in studio and what we call general purpose, that they'd be your bookable studio rooms. 
Um, the, the rest, another kind of broadly speaking, 5% in computing workshops collections, um, social a, a bit higher in the academic, um, in m much l lower. Um, and very high utilization. Uh, higher than normal utilization, I think actually that's an understatement, it's incredibly high. Typical rates in, in um, higher education would be 16 to 20%. So, you, you know, what we've heard about people struggling to find places to work or what have you, the, the evidence is, is there. Um, you've been working under very difficult uh, circumstances. And high utilization, I would say, um, in the other areas as well, collection, social and, and um, office. Uh, predominantly small group learning, um, less than 20 people in 70% of learning groups. I think we identified 197 groups, of which 70% of those were less than 20 people. This is helpful information for us because it gives us a feel for the kinds of sizes that one needs to be identifying. It also supports what we heard um, in talking to people about the pedagogy model in operation. And one also thinks that maybe some of this is driven by the, the, the building. Maybe some of it is driven, and what we've felt continually throughout is, is actually an incredibly sensitive understanding of your buildings and your context, and allowing buildings to form who you are, and also allowing those buildings to be formed by I who you are too. So really rich, rich dialogue. Um, I'm not going to go through these ones, I think, too much detail, but you might just like to look at th this, um, how it's spread over the week. The way to read this is you can see the, the five blocks, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and each of those um, blocks within the blocks is an hour. So again, typically in a higher education institution, you, you would find not so much <coughs> happening on Monday, not so much happening on Friday, very little on a Friday afternoon, if, if anything. Um, you're consistently high through, through out, out the, the week. Uh, we stopped at six o'clock, but it's quite obvious that you haven't stopped at six o'clock. It, it, it continues on. Um, moving on to conservation. Um, we posed a, a number of, of questions, and a lot of them actually quite practical. What are the, the issues? What areas could we begin to open up? How can we get enhanced access? How can we get better toilets? Um, is there a possibility for a new build at, at Morrill Street? And what about the space in between? Um, these are the some of the things that one needs to be aware of. You're in a conservation area, you've got listed buildings, and you also, Bedford Square Gardens is um, additionally listed uh, as well. And our conservation um, architect has said the best way to deal with this is actually to prepare an outline conservation statement which is underway. It covers these kind of headings. You won't be able to read them from the back, but it, I mean, the mind boggles as to what a full conservation statement is if this is the outline one. But what it'll do, it'll, it, it, it'll give us um, a, a road map for what are the things we need to bear in mind as, as we um, begin to work with the estate. It was a question of could we make more use of the gardens? Um, could we actually build a, a temporary structure that might uh, suit uh, work for other educational facilities as well? It looks like that would be incredibly difficult to do, but that hasn't stopped us doing things before. And again, there are precedents in um, Cavendish Square and, and such like. Um, I suppose my, my question or my thought back to people would be, is that really where we want to put our energy? But fantastic competition. Um, uh, uh, other things that maybe we could engage with that conversation, other ways of engaging with that conversation. Um, Post building economics questions were um, a, a lot simpler in a way is what economic issues do we want to keep in, in mind if we want to maximize rear development and if we want to develop the, the space in, in between? Um, Looking at the back, if we were to align the floors of 16, 32, and 36, in space planning terms, this is a sensible thing, thing to do. It may not be in, in architectural terms or in, in experiential, but we thought, let's come at this from lots of different angles. What you actually get if you, if you do that, if we do 32, 33 in phase one, and phase two then as um, 34, 36, retaining the, the street facade, uh, you get a 50 square meters net s space gain, a lot of hassle, decant, uh, site work, um, et cetera. It would cost you about 3.5 million, and you're actually only generating half a million um, additional value. So you're actually spending more to, to gain less. It, it, it doesn't stack up financially. Um, if we look at, say, well, let's forget trying to align um, uh, 34, 36 with number 16, and let, let's start with 32, 34, and start working the other way. Well, what does that do for us? 
you get a bit better space gain. You get about a, a, a 150 square meters. This, by the way, includes removing the link bu buildings. Um, um, it'll cost about 1.5 million, and you actually generate um, a, a, an additional uh, million value. So basically, it'll cost you 500,000. It may be worth doing, doing this for operational um, re re reasons. Talked about extending into the rear of 3031. It just looks, when you see it there, the two small buildings there, the white and the one beside it, um, it, it just looks like too attractive a, a proposition to um, ignore. Um, we haven't gone into it in any further detail, but it'll be, I think, similar kind, kinds of figure, and it's nice to know that the possibility is there, even if not acted upon. You don't need, to, need it at the moment. Looking at the space in between, all of that stuff in the middle comes to about 500 square meters. What happens if you remove it? You actually get 600 square meter yards, total ground area, if, if, you, if you clear it all. It's difficult to predict the cost of this because it can be anything from the price of demolition and make good to an all singing, all dancing, uh, completely environmentally controlled at atria. Um, one thing to be aware of here is the 1.5 million reduced property value and needing to go back to Bedford's estates and saying, you, you, you know, we need to take a view on this. Um, if, if we were to do this, would we have to reinstate that property value? Can we actually say, put forward a case for saying, no, we, we, we gained the money back in other ways? So overview of, of building economics um, considerations. Um, an excellent ec ec economic argument for staying on the existing side. I have to say it was one of the first things we thought about when we heard about what it was people wanted to do, should you actually move. It doesn't make, I, I think certainly we heard it doesn't make cultural sense, it doesn't make organizational sense, and it doesn't make um, economic sense to move. You're effectively 25% below comparable market rate. More well street billion buildings, there's actually limited economic um, value in redeveloping them, but there may actually be operational requirements why you may wish to do so. Space in between is the place where you're actually going to get the, the most um, ad advantages. And in terms of these, these buildings, there is a price to be paid for holding, hold, holding on to them, but it, one would say it's a price worth paying. But we've got DDA compliance issues, fit for purpose throughout, and um, services. And I, 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 I think we live, with, we live with the price of doing that for, for other reasons. Looking at the AA tomorrow, um, the, proposed, the model we'd like to propose is that it's incremental and it's opportunistic. And we would like to suggest that it, it's based on three values, um, the kinds, uh, or sorry, three cr criteria, decision-making criteria, starting with AA values. And the kinds of words that came up were legacy, experimentation, improvisation, innovative pedagogy, domestic scale. Domestic came up um, a, lo a lot, actually. But to work very carefully with the space patterns, and we would say there, you know, think about um, the square type space, the street type space, and the in-between space. In terms of funding potential, we're going to have to look at projects that are attractive to possible funders and um, sponsors. Say, uh, in addition to the three decision-making criteria, you might want to look at five briefing ele elements. Uh, in terms of purpose, this is orga organizational <coughs> need, and we would suggest that it needs to be both pragmatic and visionary. Space and budget, uh, we're looking at what's both required and available, and I think the issue here is how long is a piece of, of, of string. What we think we might need in terms of space might simply not be available. What we think we need in terms of um, budget might not be available, etc. So one's always looking to find a balance there. In terms of time scale, there are things that we really can't wait, must do now, but one would hope that it's done in terms of a, 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 a long-term game plan. And conservation, it, it's um, re respecting the fact that we're in a very special context. I'm going to go through each of these, one, one by uh, one now, a li little bit more. Um, this, we, we've talked about th this one, and it goes back to the original idea of the AA as a learned um, society and where one is on that learning trajectory, we tap into it in, in different ways, at, at different stages as, uh, through our professional careers. Um, interesting in the conversations we had wi with students, uh, the conversation started with we want flexibility to work and socialize across a range of space types, and everywhere is a place for both working and socializing. Actually, when asked a little bit more about that, um, I think we began to think, hmm, not, not quite sure about this. Um, because we also want space to be more hierarchical and, and to serve different functions. And there is a feeling of 
because you've been so uh, cramped for space, of working wherever it is possible to work, but it means that nobody has a chance to, to get, a, get away at any time. Um, there were, I think there was also the feeling too of um, acknowledging the, the importance of the review of public events or so, and tho those being getting into a different mindset for those. Um, so running through, I think we, we know that we need a range of, of settings, studios and general purpose, uh, computing and, and workshops to support that. The collections, we think there's a case for looking at the collections um, together in terms of library, archive, photo library, publications, bookshops. There is the um, social and public. Um, again, I've put the, kept the bookshop in there because it hovers be between both. Uh, there are offices. I'm not going to go through each of these. Storage, which is um, an issue for everyone from the storing of work in progress, work waiting for assessment, for display, etc. Uh, the library, which is really um, as, as struggling, and also end of year bringing materials in and getting rid of them uh, afterwards. And interesting, I think, circulation. What came up again and again was the, the idea that um, uh, the stairs being, being so important, being part of the character of the school, and certainly I find if I've walked up and down the stairs with anyone, three or four meetings happen um, uh, along the way. So I think what we have is a good structure, stair structure here in terms of the houses, but when we'll be looking at getting uh, lateral going across this way and also going from rear, rear to, to back. Um, overlaid, I think we, we have a sense of, of the, the kind of space types and you, you'll recognize them. I think that what's less clearly talked about, about is um, but the, we're identified with a range of organizational ov overlays. You have group sizes, um, and actually do a lot of uh, learning in, in, in different group, group sizes. The activity type, uh, everyday, occasional, and, and spe special. And the ownership models, um, open access, supervised, bookable, allocation, of course, borrowed by, by Bedford um, Square gar Gardens. And my own feeling is that there, there is a, if one becomes more, um, I, I think you, you tap into all of these, I think you use them all, I think if you become, use them more knowingly, there's actually an awful lot you, you, you can do to make the space that you, you've got work harder, work, work better. Looking at, the, um, then looking at space, what, what you have got and, and what might become available, um, this one we've already seen. I've put it up and the dotted line actually shows what the space existing is and what we would propose your space allocation should be. We were asked what this was based on. Um, it's based on, uh, I'll just read them out because I think you won't be able to see from the back. Um, space survey data, LSC space planning model, that's the um, Learning Skills Council. Uh, what, what space is available, what you've said, what we've um, observed, and our experience of other um, organizations and institutions. Um, I think it's, it's a guideline, and I think you, you, you can begin to shift some of those. So basically what we're recommending is that the studio space, you now have enough stu studio space, as your estate gets bigger, you don't increase your studio space, so its overall percentage goes down, but you don't actually lose any space of what you've al already got. Um, the l collections, we, we would say, goes up. Uh, we think office space should go down a li little bit, and um, circulation ne needs to come up. And I, I think partly it's because I think you do need it more, but I think it's also about recognizing the important role that circulation plays in terms of creating a network of, of communication. So we're looking at saying come back to in around the 50 place for your learning spaces, um, give yourself more room for social and uh, uh, commercial etc. for non-school uh, activities or supporting school uh, activities and in increase the, the, the core. Um, more important I think than looking at space quantities is actually looking at what that space does for you and what we're looking at for an estate of 5,800 square meters is a Total number of workplaces of about 1,000, uh, 100 there, there, about 1,070. And what we're looking to see I is that what the estate provides is the opportunity for people to work and be in the, the estate in a range of different ways. And you, you'll see that we're saying that, you know, 73% of that is given over to studios and, and, and general purpose. And uh, again, you can begin to shift those, those numbers as you, as you go along. The, the numbers are derived from space norms applied to each space type. Okay, we looked at what the space available was. Um, 
If you were to remove all of those um, link spaces, you've got up to 6,300 square meters net, and you begin to get a yard space that, that you can use. Balancing the books. We're recommending that you have a requirement of 5,800 square meters. We're recommending that the uh, estate has 6,300. This gives you a net surplus of 500 square meters. You also have um, potential to expand into 3031, and you get 600 square meters of yard space for continual reinvention. Um, this is an incredibly good position to be in, in, in terms of uh, m moving forward. Budget and time is a bit trickier. Um, what we've got, we, we think we need to take these two together and look at short term, and we've again asked what's short term. We've said 18 months. That might seem quite long here, but <laughs> let's say 18 months. Long term is seven plus year, years. And what we're looking for is what are the funding opportunities um, to get us a quick project, minimum intervention, but have a major impact, uh, but also thinking about major re realignment. And we're giving you a suggested fundraising target of 10 million pounds over the next um, five to 10 years. Um, I don't know how that sits with Esther there. <laughs> and this is actually, it's a, a Victorian cake divider. It's, I, one thinks that what we will be doing, in, you know, it, it kind of slices it. it. It tells you whether you're slicing quarters, thirds, eighths, fifteenths. I'm not sure where we get to before we've got a, a plate of crumbs. But um, one has a feeling that these fundraising, they may come from a number of different um, packages, a number of different types of projects and sources and such like. Uh, we've given some indicative figures here in terms of um, the, the, the um, estate. But I, I think when you bring your, your own no uh, networks and knowledge into play, that that may look very, very different. Bringing it all together, yeah, these were the five briefing elements for developing the, the, the space brief. Um, one of the things, uh, I, I think what we felt what was that we don't want to prescribe, we don't want to freeze a conversation that's only j just starting. I'm wondering were there one or two moves that could be made that would actually improve your options, yeah, and, and allow you to move forward in, in uh, maybe not completely knowing where yet. Um, so looking at the idea of we've got about 50-50 space, uh, street space and, and square space, Suggesting a new entrance at number 32, it, it feels that if you, number 32 is the portico to the, the, the square, that actually taking that kind of presence on, on the square seems to be important. We'll also accept that it's not the best place to enter an estate in terms of moving out from there, and it's also not great in terms, you know, the heart of the AA has always been, the historical heart and social heart and every other heart now is um, th th 34 to 36. But one feels that, um, maybe it's time to take a bigger place within in the square with a bigger estate. Um, a couple of other things we maybe would suggest is the lifts. If you put lifts in these two positions, you'll actually sort out your DDA access for um, the Bed Bedford buildings, which um, seems an important thing to do. Um, another suggestion is to maybe consider knocking down 33 because it, it's so little space, it's more or less worthless. While deciding what to do in the long term, it may be helpful to put up some kind of site uh, goods access so that you can begin to get access for big things down and, and up. And another thing you might want to do is continue that along the Morwell Street facade because with, through that you can actually begin to enter studio space into number 16, into 36, 6, 34, and you can also use it to deal with the level differences. But I think in a kind of light, um, uh, um, temporary way um, on, until you know what you might want to do in the longer term. There is the possibility where I think one would never expand further um, th this way or it, it's not possible to. You could think about closing off that, that end, end there and it may be a place to start getting some decent um, to toilets and, and some um, decent plant uh, um, etc. It could also be a fantastic terrace just looking all the way back down. Now in terms of the blank canvas, um, I'm not suggesting, and I think the team's not, not suggesting that you go bulldo bulldoze down all those in-between buildings um, straight away. But one does feel, um, apart from the one at 3436, um, 
There's very little in that space. It's circulation and it's toilets and it's not very well de designed. And my own sense is that, that the actually having the ground area and yard space and working space would be more u useful to you. Getting there, and we're, we're getting there too. We're, how long have I got it? Another maybe 10 minutes, yeah. Um, suggestion is to start from what already exists, to bring the new spaces into play. And you can see with the dark blue there, there's actually a lot the, the, um, for, to, to play with. Um, and creating a smart quilt and where everything is potentially a space for working and socializing and maybe not being too prescriptive <coughs> in space terms, that what one is actually focusing on is the organizational model which decides whether it's for working or socializing and not the space model. And what we've got here are what we've called some quilt weaving suggestions. Things to think about, uh, uh, um, and we're not saying that they work, they haven't been tested in terms of conservation or in terms of numbers or in terms of economics, but we wanted to give some thoughts for how you might look at the estate in this way. And looking at uh, studio and general purpose, I think we, um, what we heard was that we need a variety of um, studio types. If we go to the third floor and look at what's already existing there, um, what one might do is, if we get our external goods core and our external goods access, we can begin to think about how we would use the, the back studios. Um, because you've raised floor in the back uh, in number 16, it seems to make sense to put more of the technology-driven um, units there. In the front, it's um, looking at uh, studios which um, can be open, whether the, the, the light beam, whether they're either owned or they can be touched down, and keeping to the, the, the core pedagogic principle of, of group teaching through a number of really nice rooms. Um, offices scattered throughout to support what's happening there and the potential for lateral access. Don't have to do lateral access in this way. You may decide to actually work with the character of the houses and not have any lateral access and actually work vertically just um, with a series of doors op opening off, off the, the square. Workshops, I, one of the things that came out of the workshops, and the workshop uh, guys have done, done great work in, in terms of how their facilities might work together, how we'd be shared, lovely diagrams which um, we, we've been given. But what came from there was that actually having a large assembly area would enab enable um, us to use the workshops much more, more effectively. So one immediately looks to the yard so coming to the basement, we did think it would be much easier for them to be on the ground floor, get materials in and, and, and such like, but um, still, still working that one through. But looking at the staying in the basement, if we thought about this as a quick fix rather than a, a long-term realignment, is by knocking down the extension there to um, uh, 33 and 34, you actually begin to create um, a really good, decent-sized yard. Similarly, if you knock down the tiny little extensions to um, 37 and 38, uh, you begin to get another decent yard there. Um, suggesting uh, a studio space which, or space which has just been given over studio might also become an extension of the workshop, but would probably have to, wouldn't have to be careful what facilities would go there. Similarly, you could extend workshop facilities further over, and this good lifts becoming a, a, a way of getting big materials up and down, etc. Um, collections, uh, we definitely need more space. Uh, initial thought was that um, it could go with number 16, but you think spec office building, I'm sure that doesn't have floor loadings to take libraries, and indeed it doesn't. Uh, but maybe there's another way of, of looking uh, at this, which is, whoops, uh, sorry, some of these colors have changed from, from my, my screen. Um, is to a very strong feeling from um, a lot of people we talked to about not moving the library. And, and yet, looking at it from um, a library operational point of view, it simply doesn't work there in, in terms of serving needs. But wondering, is there a way that one could actually begin to use the, the rooms if we can get some la lateral access, which we think that we will be able to do in terms of conservation and, and planning? Not, not tested, so that what you can then have a library which is a series of rooms and a series of rooms that can suit different functions. You won't be able to put bookshelves on all of the floors, but you should be able to get a certain amount of, of, of books in, in, in and uh, around. Um, 
Another way of doing that would actually be to take over one whole building and say it's a library house. Um, social, I think we heard a lot about the, the importance of the bar and um, maybe uh, a play where the bar is now, I, I think it's, it's, it's way too small now for um, the, the number of people that it needs to um, accommodate. And looking at moving it into 32, 33, they're beautiful rooms and actually having a really nice set of rooms there to, to use, some of which can be noisy, some of which can be quiet, but actually that would serve a, 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 a complete membership, um, whether it, 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 it's school, alumni, whatever. Um, okay, public. Now th this was the one that really challenged us. Um, Looking at the ground floor, the space here is about 150 square meters. Um, we were asked about a, a lecture theater to accommodate 500. Just using a rule of thumb, you'd be looking at one square meter per person. We're talking about 500 square meter uh, uh, theater. Um, if you look over to the only development opportunity in terms of knocking down 32, 33, you get 140 square meters. It just, it simply doesn't stack up. Um, but that does bring us back to, well, what is this blank canvas anyway? And can, you know, with, with, with technology, with the, the, the idea of lecture as an event anyway, do we actually really need a, a, a room? Um, can it be, become so, something um, else? And then I suppose one of the challenges it becomes is what, 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 what is this place? What, how is it used on an everyday basis? Can it actually be used for special events, parties, and, and um, su such like? And what is the minimum thing we need to do? to enable all of those things happen. You know, we don't want to get too heavy-handed about this. Um, okay, and that brings us back, actually, to a major realignment strategy. I think we need to put in place some kind of roadmap which is as light touch as possible so that when we are making decisions about smaller interventions, we have some sense of what that means in terms of a whole. And similarly, when we are going looking for, for funding, and I think what I, we would say is that the next, the, in the coming weeks, this is what we'll be trying to get a handle on from, from people, is what do you feel that this should actually be? And I think we're almost there now, get, getting started. What we have is um, data review. Um, it's great to have the data, and I think we should mine it for all it's worth. And certainly the space data, we'll, we'll be looking for building committee workshop on that. Uh, priority setting. Um, I, I think, you know, we can talk and talk and talk and wait for the perfect plan and what have you and um, get more and more frustrated. I think what we're very keen to do is actually uh, run student workshops in, in the coming weeks and actually identify what the, the priorities are. Uh, we'd like to do something which is about um, generating ideas, get as many ideas, ideas as possible because we're, the development model we're suggesting I think is one that is inclusive ideas of ideas rather than either are. And why do we want these things? What we want to do is to um, develop strategies. And the three that, that we we're looking at are one is major realignment, um, two is a fundraising campaign, and three is an estate development program. And w in terms of the estate development program, the, there's, I, I, there's a feeling here of, of kind of walking the talk finding out what you want to say as you're doing it, such like, and that maybe this is the way to develop the, um, the estate development, or sorry, to the develop the, the estate as well, is that it becomes a living thing. It's not a master plan that's, um, that's frozen a, a, as soon as it's done, but it becomes your way of guiding discourse within the architectural profession, within the um, education of um, architectural disciplines. Um, the skills required, we would say, to in order to do that, uh, curiosity, what do we need to know? Um, I think there's sometimes uh, a surprising reluctance to actually look at data. Um, and and um, because if we're honest, when we start to lo lo look at data, it does challenge us. And it tests some of the things that we've always believed to be, be true. So I, I would just say that data can also remove a lot of the heat from conversations that get over emotional. Uh, imagination, no shortage of that. Uh, I think, what would it be like if? Um, I wonder if, uh, etc. And, and courage, let's give it a go. Le le let's find out. And on that note, I think it's time to hand over. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to.
to take questions, yeah, I think. <laughs> This is purely pragmatic, but when can we actually get some floor plans so we can look at things to trigger things in our own mind for our own departments? Um, yeah. The floor plans are available now, Hinda, so I think I'd hand that one over to Brett. Is, is we can, they're ready for putting on a, on a website. If I thought that was uh, that was great, uh, and certainly for me, it was it forced me to look quite differently at the buildings, which is a good thing to do. You get very uh, entrenched into seeing the spaces in certain ways, and I guess, like a lot of other members of the school, I, I wasn't aware of some of the new acquisitions and, and how that actually starts to look as a sort of three-dimensional stacking up of possible spaces and the yard. I never really thought of that, so that, I think that's really. probably more a, a reflection for the school rather than for you, which is what, what I think the strategy you're suggesting, which is this continuous process of sort of intelligent negotiated change in relation to finding our, our way in this, throws back again to the school how we, how we should do that. There's a process which you're obviously starting with this idea of some student discussions about space, but I think it's an important issue now for the school how we can yeah. organize a rich process which is inclusive, but is also able to make steps, and you may or may not be able to uh, advise or be involved in that, but I think it's, it's very important for the school, obviously. So it's not so much a question, it's a reflection that if in general we can understand the potential that you're showing us, and we need more time, I think, to look at the statistics and the stuff that you've gathered, there's a lot of uh, really quite interesting data there then how do we as a school then start to set up the, the most productive process for moving forward? So it's not really a question, it's a reflection that we need to, to think about how to do that. I think, Hugo, with um, the priority setting workshops will actually help us to define that process um, because it, they, they will identify where we need to target. Mm. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, so, so one of the things you didn't talk about, and I, it's probably not so relevant, the, the, there are presumably legal niceties not only to do with the listed buildings, yeah. which set up certain very hard edge things and disabled access and so on. But maybe also with Bedford Estates, yes. that we aren't completely free to yeah. decide on things. Uh, but clearly we've got a lot more flexibility within the box than, than we would have if we had a, a commercial landlord and, and very yeah. limited space. They're, they're, they're fairly benign towards us, but it does give us a lot of flexibility. And I, I think being quite tactical in, in terms of how, how you approach them, knowing what step one, two, and three might be, and what, when to play your car, your full hand and when not to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think. Uh, I, I just wanted to say one other thing. It, the, the client here is also membership. Um, yes. After all, um, they will what you know they have the long-term sort of tenure of the buildings. And I, I just think it's not just school. It, there are other, other sort of uh, constituencies. Yeah. Hi. Uh, <coughs> I have a, a very straightforward question uh, regarding what you're proposing and what the influence comes from. Is it a surprise to all of us in here? Or can you give us a percentage of how much comes from students, council, director's office? In terms of uh, moving the kind of heart of the A to a different building and these quite big, is it, is it only you that's proposing this now, or does it come from from us? Um, I think I'd have to say it's our team. Uh, you know, just given everything that we've looked at in terms of the state, given what we've heard you talk about and what's important, um, we, we would say 
consider moving the entrance to number 32. What's your view on it? Well, it, um, in the conversation I've been involved in, uh, I think the conversation has been driven more towards the uh, the emotions of yeah. this place, yeah. uh, which is always diffi difficult to describe. Um, so I th although the work of this place is always very experimental, we're quite conservative when it comes to this building. And yeah. Uh, you don't. You don't have to do it immediately. You know. And again, I think you. You just. You take on the buildings and watch and see what happens. What happens when new people come? When your visitors come? You, you know. I, I. think you can because I think you're in such a good position in terms of what's been happening over the last few years in terms of building this estate. You can actually now move at a pace that suits you, and some things you will want to move very quickly on. Others which have big emotional. Uh, kind of, com uh, um, I was going to say complication, not complications, I mean in a positive way, that have emotional investment. You can take your time and take those ones much more slowly if need be. Could I just, sorry, uh, another straightforward question to Brett. Um, not about opportunities that it, this might, might kind of result in, but these core things, what do you think about them? The opening the courtyard? Moving, moving the entrance, uh, possible demolition of buildings, kind of very straightforward what your opinion is towards what they're proposing. My opinion is the kind of questions that are being asked are part of the mindset. The brief that, the brief that Fiona and, uh, and the team were given is really one of trying to form the, a set of questions that are productive for the entire A to think about the school and the buildings. I don't read any of these at this stage as a proposal of any kind, and I think Fiona was emphasizing that. And, and what we were asking in the original brief that was set in, in the selection of Fiona and the team was that they could, in conversation across the school, which is a process that started over the summer, start to put together the questions which then, when put back to the AA, can start to shape that brief. The ones I'm seeing seem like very interesting questions to ask of us, and exactly the kind of questions that we haven't really ask of ourselves before. So in that way, I find it a really productive piece of work at this stage of the consultation. I think it's going to go on quite quickly to a next stage, which is sitting down with smaller groups of people to talk about in more detail and to listen to a range of responses to these kind of suggestions. But my initial reaction is I don't see anything that's not being asked now, which is probably the first thing I would want to make sure to address at this sort of stage. I mean, I think that's also part of a consideration of what's being presented. Are there things that we ought to also add to the conversation as it goes forward in the next few weeks and months? But I think those kind of questions, which is, you know, w which includes are there a couple of key principles that we know we need to have on the brief, access to the different floors that we don't have now, a question of where and how to access, to enter the site, not just from a public sense, but also from service, those kind of questions seem really useful at this stage. And also that there doesn't seem to be, as I see the presentation at this point, that there doesn't seem to be a single obvious kind of solution that's right or wrong, but that there might be a series of alternatives for people to look mm -hmm. at. And yeah. I find that really, really very useful at this point. Other questions? Um, you mentioned that uh, the sort of process is set out that there is now sufficient studio space. I'm just wondering if you can uh, fill us in a bit on what the process has been to derive that, um, whether if student numbers shrink and expand, how that, how that changes, sort of how we've got to the square meterage we have now. What we um, actually, in, in terms of looking at the, the right amount of, of studio space, and I would have to say there is no right amount. <laughs> um, uh, what we think is the general ballpark park to be in is, is based on uh, a 650 um, student full-time full uh, equivalent. Um, more than that, it's actually based on what we call guided learning hours. It's the amount of hours, contact time, um, et cetera, that each person has. Now, if you up the numbers, what you do is, in order to manage with the same amount of space, 
you begin to change pedagogy. You begin to change some of those, those activities. You, you redistribute redis them. Um, I, I'm not going to go into it in full de detail here because I, I think what it would be much better to get Grace here, here for this and to go through the, the space planning um, mo model. But what's lovely about it is it is a flexible model that actually keeps you as the user fully in control. Other questions back here? Hi, um, there are some suggestions that you propose, like for example, moving the bar to 32 mm -hmm. as the entrance, that I think might put us in a very awkward position because as, you put, as the bar is right now, it's sort of in the middle where people yeah. will have to inevitably cross it. And if you go to sort of a more practical, let's have enough space for everyone, you might lose that dynamic, which is so inherent to us right yeah. now. Yeah. So there are some suggestions that might think logical in a sort of pragmatic point of view, but would sort of make us lose a big part of our identity on how we navigate through the school. Which is like th that moment, like for example, when you go up the stairs and you see the bar to the right and you see library to the left, that is sort of a, a moment that personally I think is either I have a, a, a lunch break or I just go and study. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, in, no, in it's that. It's always a lunch break. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible duality. But I mean, that, that, that kind of. I mean, going Sorry back also to yesterday's yeah. uh, meeting with Charles and Brett, yeah. we, we are always in that situation where we are rubbing yeah. shoulders all the time. And I don't think that we should lose ne never that, absolutely. regardless of how many space we have. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I, I agree, agree with that. And again, this is one that I would probably hedge my bets on. And uh, I would probably keep something there, but it might become a different type of bar. It might be something which becomes something part of the library which is about informal working or such like. And I think when you have Bedford Square there and these beautiful, beautiful rooms, actually, that it is where maybe the bar, bar should be. It just should be gorgeous space. Um, that's not to say that you don't have some kind of facility there that continues to help you rub shoulders and make that decision between <laughs> lunch or library. thoughts at this stage? Yeah. Um, I understand that um, uh, the most, um, your, your uh, presentation here is based on the, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> on the data survey which you have been uh, doing over the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, and a lot of your uh, statements are based on this empirical data. So how is that data survey actually representing the school, since I think the survey would change if it would be towards the end of the term or in the beginning of the term or in different parts Absolutely. of the year. It, it is simply a snapshot of uh, what one week. Um, it's actually, I have to say, it, it's, um, it's one of five kind of strands in, in the, that, that we've had. So we, we certainly haven't given it any more weight than we've given uh, economic considerations, conservation considerations, what people have told us. Um, and we, we can't because it's, it's simply a snapshot. But I, I think a snapshot is better than nothing. And what was interesting for us is it, it made us more careful of what we were listening to and also very confident that what people were telling us that they knew about themselves was actually correct. <laughs> there was evidence there, there to back it up. In Uh, no. Uh, yeah, this is just a <laughs> general observation and a bit to echo something that's already been said. And I think it's just that a lot of people in the building feel, you know, we are very experimental, but at the same time, not just the buildings, but a number of things, we are really quite conservative. Yeah. And I think you've probably experienced this already. You know, I mean, I don't think anyone would have had the courage to suggest moving the bar. Um, so I think it's quite refreshing to see someone coming from the outside with suggestions, etc. And I think it, it will really start asking quite a lot of questions to us in terms of 
why is this an interesting place? Is it because the bar is really there, or is it much more because we do? And is there a different place the bar can be located where we will still walk by it, etc.? Um, and I think um, I think the note on courage, I think, is probably um, is probably the one to uh, to think about there. So um, I think my that's feeling was that the skills are here very, very strongly in the work you do, and what we're asking is that you actually begin to use that same skill set and apply it to something which will be much closer to the heart <laughs> and not to underestimate the amount of courage that that will take. Hi. Um, no, I, it was really great, and I just want to uh, back up on what Henrik said. It, it, it's funny, because obviously coming in from the outside, you're able to give a relatively dispassionate uh, overview on mm. what we are, who we think we are, what, what we do, what we think we do. And, and I guess there's a, there's a funny tension in you present something use the word data a lot, right? Mm. And I guess there's this idea that data is somehow, you know, data is more dispassionate than maybe other forms of communication. But the, the, there's a perverse uh, re uh, result of, uh, of, of data and, and, and being neutral, which is actually a number of extraordinarily iconoclastic uh, <laughs> propositions. <Yes. laughs> um, and, and I guess, you know, it, it, it's not surprising given the history of the school and a kind of, uh, a sort of, I mean, it's one of these things where, you know, you, you come to love the very thing that works against you. Absolutely. And I think that's what we've probably all, you know, the, the weird relationship we've developed with this, yeah. with this building. If I, if I think of it r rationally, if I were to not be me and look at from the outside, it'd be, well, I've never had enough space. I've always had, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but somehow, you know, like in a Stockholm syndrome, you turn that around, and you, you sort of say, "Well, actually, no, that's the very reason why things are great," you know, and it should it should never ever change. I but but uh, but I guess I'm I'm just going through the same um, sort of emotional, <laughs> uh, sort of acrobatics, which is to say, well, of of course, my my, my initial reaction to those fundamental propositions, you know, that the lecture hall wouldn't be here, that the library wouldn't be upstairs, is to react adversely to it. Mm. But obviously then I think it's important that I, I and I guess all of us actually scrutinize where that is coming from and whether that's really the most important, you know, yeah. thing. Because I, I guess we're in a, in a really unprecedented situation where things have been the way they have been because we haven't had a choice, you know. Um, but for the first time ever, we're given a choice. And, and in that sense, it's important, I think, to get over that first hurdle yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of seeing, you know, any, of any proposal uh, as, as a kind of dispassionate, iconoclastic misunderstanding of who we are. Um, and, and somehow, you know, I, I guess have a, have a series of conversations mm. about what really matters. And the one uh, so. characteristic that I, I would say is very important not to lose is actually that thing about tension. And I don't believe the tensions should be resolved. I think they should just be managed better. Because as soon as you resolve them, um, I, 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 I think creativity goes. <laughs> Can I just also make a, a couple of observations? When we um, uh, looked to hire space consultants, we interviewed three, and Fiona uh, was the unanimous choice of the, of the small committee that met. Um, one of the other co consultants said, well, um, the AA is a set of buildings that has cellular organization and it's a set of silos, which of course we would want to change. And of course everybody in the, in the, in the committee sort of stiffened at that point. Um, and it, it's a very curious thing that it, the, we, we're in 18th century buildings and yet um, we have the possibility now of a very flexible organization. And th those silos, and we were here yesterday with some of the students talking about, well maybe different interest groups could gather together and it wouldn't be a school that had first year and then inter and then diploma but actually you'd get um, an organization by, by, by uh, interest or by um, uh, subject matter. So I think what, what, we, what we've got now is the opportunity not just for well, the bar to move but the bar to continuously move and you know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to change 
not just once for all time, but actually to have a continuous experimentation about how education could be. And just one other observation, when Fiona uh, had her interview, she talked about a project, a building project, that could be a piece of furniture. You mentioned feature or, or something. Well, that we could actually design a piece of furniture that yeah. might be the bar. <coughs> so maybe, you know, maybe the bar is there. Uh, you know, for some of the year and, and there for other parts of the year. So I, I, I just think we have the slop space, we have the ability to really play around with, with education and with our environment. And I think that we should celebrate that and jump onto it. Just a bit of water. Just water. Yeah. Well, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to sort of get a little bit more discussion in terms of some of the moves that you're talking about because it seems that some of the program spaces obviously are operating the way they do with a certain sense of intimacy mm. and uh, a lot of the proposals that you're making at the same time is trying to centralize that kind of activity and I think in some cases that works but there were some programs possibly let's say for example workshops and so forth when you try to sort of accumulate it all in one stretch, maybe it doesn't function with these set of buildings, and maybe it's not a desired result anyway. I'm, I'm just kind of questioning in terms of what things are obviously able to be flexible and free and programs that we can start to really talk about uh, its capacity to move around, and then other things that obviously are very fixed, yeah. um, either to do with, let's say, for example, the issue of the lecture hall, there's a lot of people that program a lot of interesting things, and yeah. I think one of the dynamic is the public program. The capacity to actually entertain more events instead of larger events, I think, is something that we should yes. be discussing as well. Yeah. So I'm just talking about natu the nature of the discussion, yeah. um, which I think would start to solve out a lot of these kind of questions, yeah. because I think one issue is the actual space, but the other thing is actually opportunities to increase the amount of events and the type of events that are happening. So yeah. I just sort of bring that to the, yeah. the discussion because it seems like, yeah. um, aside I from public programs, even the issue of workshops, I think this, the workshop itself is being treated as a kind of generic yeah. uh, definition. But right now, there's a whole series of different kinds of skill sets from craft to digital prototyping yeah. Yeah. that don't necessarily need to be housed in the same or in a very proximate uh, place and maybe those are much freer to sort of disperse and change and things like I think the comment about the heart of the space of the school, things that people come to because of a greater kind of purpose like bars and so forth, maybe they do sort of maintain that kind of familiar yeah. uh, practice yeah. that's kind of evolved. I don't know but I'm just stating that there seems to be an interest to also bring in some hierarchy of what actually could change and what couldn't so that it's not a complete free-for-all about wishful thinking, but it's more a much more pragmatic look, being sensitive, I think, to all the different kinds of issues that are going to be raised in the next week or two. I, I would say, 